Serial Box presents Remade. Season 2, Episode 4, Child's Play. Written by E.C. Myers. Narrated by Greg Tremblay. Loki slowly surveyed the area surrounding Sanctuary, just in case more caretakers were lurking around. But since he and the others had defeated the two robots guarding the bunker, all was quiet. And cold. The adrenaline rush from the battle and their victory had worn off, and now all he felt was tired and anxious. Even if there were more caretakers out there, he didn't think the group could handle them right now. Sunita locked eyes with him for a moment and smiled. That silent exchange gave him the burst of energy he needed, way better than a cup of coffee. He missed coffee. Focus, Loki thought. He turned back to the featureless metal door as Holden reached for the glowing blue hand scanner. Loki tensed and tightened his grip on the laser bazooka he'd claimed from one of the broken caretakers, readying himself for whatever might come charging out at them. Another group of caretakers, a starving army of chuds, a swarm of spider bats. Please don't be spider bats. Holden pressed his palm against the scanner and it flashed green. Loki stepped back reflexively as the door shot up lightning quick with a thud that echoed deep inside Sanctuary. If the occupants didn't already know they had visitors, they did now. He turned to see Holden drop his hand from the door plate, his expression stunned, wary. Then they both peered into the dark doorway. It's quiet, Holden said. Loki just stopped himself from saying it was too quiet. But it was. He'd been so busy trying to prepare for whatever was on the other side of the door, he'd never considered that maybe nothing was waiting for them. Disappointing. Unless, what if this was some kind of test or a trap? Loki looked up. He imagined the door crashing down on them as they crossed the threshold. He'd played too many video games that delivered cheap deaths to players, the games Rena liked, that forced you to die over and over until you memorized the pattern, mastered tricky timing, or figured out some puzzle to get to the next level. I'll go first, Holden and Loki said at the same time. They looked at each other, and then launched into rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three, Holden showed his fist as Loki presented a flat hand. Paper covered rock. As Loki stepped forward, someone shoved between him and Holden and entered Sanctuary ahead of them. Hey, Loki said. Sunita tossed a glance back over her left shoulder, her long hair fanning out, a makeshift axe in each hand. She was a total badass. Ladies first, she said. Loki's heart skipped a beat. He went after her, bazooka raised. We'll give the all clear if it's safe, he called to the others. Lights came up gradually around him and Sunita as they entered. A soft, warm glow like sunrise on a clear spring morning. The floor sloped gently downward. The corridor stretching ahead was wide enough for two of the M808B Scorpion battle tanks from Halo to drive down side by side. The walls seemed to be made of the same high-tech material as Arcadia's paved streets. With a pang, he remembered that that city was dead. Many of the city's buildings remained, but the life behind them had been snuffed out when Holden had assisted Arcadia in her suicide. Loki wasn't as surprised as everyone else that Holden had pulled the plug on Arcadia, as she'd requested. He was a good guy, and he'd been through his fair share of pain. Loki wasn't angry, either. Arcadia had made her choice, and she'd had a long time to think about it. Hundreds of years all alone with nothing but her thoughts and fading memories. Holden's decision had come from a place of compassion, but Loki did wonder if, at the last moment, Arcadia had had any regrets, if she'd realized she was making a mistake, the way Loki had at the end. He hoped not. Now, as he ventured cautiously into Sanctuary, he saw a photograph on the wall showing a construction site. A black man in a tan uniform was posed, pushing a shovel into the dirt, his uniform looked military, with epaulets and medals and all that. The guy looked to be a general. 
He stood beside an odd-looking caretaker which had a flat wagon hitched to its back. The robot was different from the ones the teens had encountered. It was smaller, with two eyes instead of one, a hinged jaw, and short legs with wide, flat feet that were more like clawed paddles. It looked like some kind of robo-dog, but the thought of caretakers with mouths made Loki shudder. Sunita waited in the center of the circular room in battle position, arms raised with her axes crossed behind her head, peering into the deeper darkness beyond. Loki stopped beside her. You should be more careful, she snorted. Says the guy who takes more risks than anyone. It's just, this isn't a game. We don't have unlimited continues. You can't Konami code your way out of a rough situation. You are such a nerd. She turned toward him and stuck out her tongue. That drew him up short, but he pressed on. The point is, we can die here and we've already lost too many. She lowered her arms and twirled the axes expertly. I can take care of myself, but your protectiveness is kind of sweet, however misplaced. She flashed him a quick grin. By the way, I like nerds. Loki was still getting used to having people he could call friends here. He'd spent so much time in his life yearning for friends, and now that he had them, he'd started to realize that there might be some disadvantages to friendship. When you cared about people, you worried about them. You wanted them to be happy. And that made you vulnerable. You also worried more about what they thought of you. Was that why he hadn't told Sunita the truth yet? Hey, my name isn't Loki, he would say. No way, Sunita would say, all astonished like. Loki is a completely believable and awesome name and it totally suits you. Yes, he would nod soberly. But my true name is Omri Sobal. That's even better, but I'll keep calling you Loki if you want. Also, I love you. And then they would kiss. Something told him it wouldn't go down that way. If Sunita found out that Loki wasn't his real name, it wasn't that big a jump to questioning whether he was the person he pretended to be. And once she realized that everything he knew about survival he had learned from video games, she probably wouldn't waste her time on him anymore. And this was the part that really made him squirm. How would she feel about him if she knew he'd killed himself? As far as he knew, that alone set him apart from everyone else here who had died in an accident, from illness, or in an act of heroism. But right now, for whatever reason, Sunita seemed into him. They looked at each other, and they both started to lean in. Oh, good, you aren't dead, Cole said. Loki hopped away from Sunita and turned to see Cole, Holden, and Nevea standing in the doorway. The big guy was smiling, but there was something behind his friendly, aw shucks expression. Annoyance? He seemed uncomfortable for sure, but he'd been acting strangely since even before Arcadia. We got tired of waiting for the all clear, Holden said. All clear, Sunita said brightly. Where's Umta? Loki asked. We thought someone should stay outside to keep watch, Cole said. Loki looked at Holden. He didn't think Holden would feel good about leaving her out there alone, and in fact, he did look uncomfortable with the decision. She doesn't like being inside anyway, Nevea said. Well, don't hang out under the doors, Loki beckoned the others forward. The group strolled inside, looking around. What do you think, Cole began, but at that moment the door crashed down behind him and they all jumped. That was close. Nevea's voice was a pitch higher than usual. What made that happen? Cole asked. Okay, no one move for a second. Let's consider the situation before something else happens, Loki said. The door opened for us. Lights came on when we entered. It's warm in here. The air smells fresh. What does that all suggest? People live here? Nevea said. Then where are they? Holden asked. They could be waiting to see if we're a threat, Loki said. That's what you would do, Holden said. Sunita nodded. And you'd leave booby traps everywhere. Could be no one's here, and this place is on autopilot, Nevea said. Sure, could be. But whatever we do next, let's stick together, Loki said. That doesn't sound like you. Holden smiled. I mean it. The best way to keep everyone safe is to watch one another's backs, Loki said. And that includes Umta. Agreed, Sunita said. 
Let's hope that door still works, Loki said. Nevaeh stepped up to the blue panel beside the door, but before she could press her hand to it, a soft voice came from the opposite doorway, from the ramp leading down into sanctuary. Hello? Loki spun around, raising his bazooka. Don't shoot! It was a child's voice. Loki kept his gun aimed into the darkness until Sunita gently pushed the barrel down. Loki shrugged. It's okay, Nevaeh said. You can come out. A young boy slowly emerged from the shadows. Loki stared at him and felt strangely unsteady, almost unable to understand what he was seeing. Somehow, the sight of killer robots and flying dragons had become more normal than seeing a little kid. After months of living with the same people, pretty confident that they were the last ones on the entire planet, here was someone new. And once again, everything he thought he'd known had abruptly shifted. Loki was surprised to realize he was grinning like a fool, suppressing the urge to whoop with joy. He was suddenly happy and hopeful in a way he hadn't been for a long time. If Sanctuary had kids, there had to be adults here too. They'd found civilization. Before Loki could move, Cole stepped forward and knelt down to the boy's eye level. He held out a hand. Hey, buddy. What's your name? Loki wasn't good at judging ages, but he guessed the kid was about five or six years old. He was white, extremely pale, with floppy brown hair. He wore a blue jumpsuit that reminded Loki of the red one he had been wearing when he woke up on the space station. In one hand, he clutched a small cube with flashing red, yellow, orange, white, green, and blue lights on it. They were all scrambled. It looked like a high-tech Rubik's Cube. I'm Ozymandias, the boy said. Loki's excitement at finding other people at Sanctuary began to fade. He couldn't put his finger on it yet, but there was something wrong with this boy. Your name is Ozymandias, really? Loki said. Sunita nudged him. Isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? That answered that. She didn't buy that Loki was his real name after all. He fell silent, scrutinizing the way the kid moved. Call me Oz. The boy smiled, but it came a fraction too late, as if he'd only just remembered to do it. Where are your parents? Cole asked. I don't have parents, Oz frowned. They're gone. Gone, Holden repeated. This is sanctuary, right? Where is everyone? This is sanctuary. Oz said. Holden's eyes met Loki's and he raised an eyebrow. How many people are here? Holden asked. Nevaeh kneeled and stretched a hand out to Oz. Who takes care of you? Guys, chill, Cole said. Give the kid some space. Oz took a couple of steps back. I'll show you everything. Follow me. He twisted the Rubik's Cube and a line of yellow squares lit up. The corridor behind him illuminated showing them that the gentle slope continued and the path curved. A sign on the far wall read SN-NA-00008. Cole stood and began to follow Oz. Hold on, Cole, Loki said. Oz, can I see your toy? It looked like that thing was some kind of remote control for sanctuary. That would come in handy. Oz held the cube up and kept walking backward. Please come. I need you. I need your help. How can we help? Holden asked. Are you taking us to the others? I'm all that's left, Oz said. Did everyone else leave? Did something happen? Loki asked. They left me, Oz said. I couldn't save them. What does it matter? Cole said, giving Loki an exasperated look. This kid needs us. We don't know anything about him or what this place is for. Loki said. But clearly something bad went down. This is sanctuary, Oz said again. You're welcome here. We have everything you need. Let me show you. Come on, let's take a look around. That's what we came for, Cole said. He's just a little boy. I think we'll be all right. Nothing is just anything, Loki said. We should know more before we go down there. Loki's right, Holden said. Fine, you all stay here but you'll feel silly about it later. Cole headed down the ramp. 
He and Oz paused as muffled thumping came from outside. The door was made of some kind of metal, at least a foot thick, so something had to be hitting it pretty hard. Get away from the door, Oz shouted. Don't worry, we shut down the caretakers, Loki said. It has to be Umta. Holden walked to the door and placed his hand on the panel. Don't, Oz screamed. The door whooshed open and Umta fell forward onto her hands and knees. Her fists were bloody, her eyes wild. Umta, what's wrong? Holden rushed to her side. Loki eyed the door above them nervously. If it came down again like before, it would crush Umta and Holden. You, okay, Umta said, gasping. We're fine. We found someone, Holden said. Umta looked up. When she saw Oz, her face softened. She hauled herself up and stumbled toward him. But about ten feet away from him, she drew up short and sniffed. Her eyes narrowed and she growled low in her throat. Umta? Holden asked. That is no child. Umta sounded both disappointed and disgusted. What? Loki asked. That is nothing. There is nothing there. Oz's eyes were wide as he turned the cube over and over in his hands, tapping a sequence of glowing lights. Holden strode forward and the boy backpedaled, but not quickly enough. Holden swept a hand at Oz's chest, and it passed through. That was rude, Oz said. You're a hologram, Holden said. I don't understand, Cole said. You're not a boy? Oz is a computer, Loki said slowly, putting the pieces together. Like Arcadia. You know Katie? Oz asked. Cole's face fell, then he scowled and turned away. It's older than all of us combined and then some, aren't you? Loki asked. Oz only smiled. Loki gripped his bazooka tighter, stupid because it was useless against a hologram, and the hologram couldn't do anything to him anyway, and drew closer to Oz. He studied its face, then walked all around it. It managed to match the lighting around it so it looked like a solid person occupying the same space they were. The only sign that Oz wasn't alive was that its chest wasn't moving. It didn't breathe. In computer games, Loki became digital characters, anything he wanted to be, even a buff warrior type that looked nothing like him in real life. In front of him was a computer game pretending to be a living person. What you chose for your avatar often said a lot about who you really were. Why are you a little boy? Loki asked. It's a trick, Umta said. She could be right, Loki figured. In the form of a kid, Oz had put them all at ease because he didn't look like a threat. It might have been an attempt to make them more willing to follow him inside Sanctuary without asking too many questions. A smart strategy that had almost worked. I don't have a choice. Oz twisted the sections of the Rubik's Cube with swift, sharp gestures. The whole cube flashed red three times. I've been stuck this way for as long as I can remember. I'm not all I used to be. All I should be. Loki's skin crawled. It was seriously creepy to see and hear a child act so unlike a child. Why were you trying to get us to follow you into Sanctuary? Holden asked. Wait. Are you Sanctuary? I take care of Sanctuary and the people who live here. But I can't do that now. Because there's no one here anymore, where did they go? Holden asked. Tears dripped down Oz's face. They looked convincing, but what were they for? The hologram didn't have real eyes, it didn't have tear ducts. Were the tears tied to some actual emotions, or were they all for show? Another tactic for the visitor's benefit to elicit sympathy? They're gone. I couldn't save them, Oz said in a pained voice. Caretakers came, and I'm the only one left. Sunita pointed an axe down the ramp into sanctuary. Are the caretakers gone too? Gone. All gone, Oz said. Then its face brightened and it wiped the tears from its face. But now you're here. Sanctuary is a good place. You'll be safe here. Loki cleared his throat. I'm guessing that caretakers killed everyone, and you couldn't do anything to stop them? That doesn't make me feel particularly safe. He looked around. 
We came to Sanctuary looking for other people. Looks like we missed them, so I say we leave. But you just got here. Oz's lower lip stuck out. Pouting, that's a nice touch, Loki said. Very human. Loki, Sunita said. No need to be mean. Your name is Loki? Really? Oz smiled. After a moment, Sunita laughed. Nevea giggled, and even Holden chuckled. Ha ha ha, Holden, Loki said. His face burned with embarrassment. Hey, it was just a joke. Like your comment before, Holden said. I thought it was funny. Sunita sounded apologetic. Don't give it too much credit. Computers are great at mimicking people, Loki said. I mean it, we should go. Umta grunted in approval. But it isn't safe out there, Oz said. That's where all the caretakers went. Like I said, we got rid of them, Loki showed at the bazooka. And we can take care of ourselves. There's food here, and you clearly need a place to rest. It looked at Umta, gestured at her bloody hands. There's a fully equipped medical facility on level four. She squeezed her hands into fists and shook her head. No! Oz turned to Loki. We even have weapons, anything you could ever need. I'll explain everything while I give you the tour. Oz swept its hand toward the ramp leading down. Holden gave the hologram a long, appraising look. We need to discuss this among ourselves first, Holden said. In private. Outside, Loki said. Please, don't go. Don't leave me alone. Oz's shoulders slumped. Nobody fell for the guilt trip. Don't worry, we'll be right back, Holden said. Oz cheered up. Sanctuary will be waiting. It exists for you. It glanced at Umta. For humans? It will follow your orders, and you can always come and go as you please. Loki tensed as they passed under the door again. He glanced back and saw Oz sitting cross-legged in the middle of the floor, watching them leave, fiddling with the Rubik's Cube. Once they made it to the small clearing by the entrance, Loki pointed to the far end, past the wreckage of one of the caretakers and away from Sanctuary's door. The others headed in that direction, Holden in the lead, while Loki kept careful watch behind them, his bazooka at the ready. Let's just keep going, Cole said. Good plan, Umta said. You didn't mean that about us coming right back, did you? Loki asked Holden. Of course not. I just wanted him to let us go, Holden said. It. Loki folded his arms. Oz seems genuine, doesn't he? Nevea said. It's not like a hologram can hurt us. We saw what happened with Arcadia. Imagine being all by yourself for centuries with no one to talk to. That doesn't sound so bad, actually, Loki thought. Don't be soft, Nevea. That thing isn't a real boy, Cole said. You're just upset that he wasn't your son, Nevea snapped. She covered her mouth, her eyes wide. I'm sorry. Cole shot her an angry look and then turned away, stuffing his hands into his jacket pockets. Loki was impressed. Nevea wasn't all sunshine and cupcakes after all. And he suspected she was right on point. Maybe it can't hurt us physically, Loki said. But Oz is still a computer intelligence. Who knows what it can do? And it did try to trick us with that little kid act. Nevea shook her head. I'm not sure it's an act. He said he was stuck that way. He's a computer. But he still has a complicated mind. I think whatever happened here along with all those years alone made him regress. In some ways, Oz really is a helpless child. Cole snorted. If something that bad happened, we should get as far away from here as possible, Loki said. Aren't you curious about what's down there and what happened to everyone? Holden asked. Loki glanced back at the entrance to the bunker. I'm not one of those people who needs answers to everything. But it sounds like you're tempted to stay. Not stay. Just look around, Holden said. What's the danger when we can leave whenever we want? We came here to find people, not another computer, Loki said. The last time didn't turn out so well. Holden looked away. Nevea wrapped her arms around herself. Even a short time in sanctuary made it feel colder outside. We need more supplies, food, clean clothes. That was all true. 
Well, Oz did mention that there are weapons too, Loki said. Only you would look for weapons in a place called Sanctuary, Sunita said. Loki clenched his jaw, but he relaxed when she smiled. And it's getting dark. We could at least stay the night, Holden said. Find out as much as possible before we get back. Loki sliced a finger across his throat to silence Holden. Holden stopped short, understanding his meaning. Don't mention the rest of the group, even outside. Sunita and Cole gave them a puzzled look, but Loki shook his head. Before we get back to our journey, Holden said. Did you guys see that sign in the entryway? SNNA00008? I'm willing to bet there are other sanctuaries, and this one is number eight. There could be dozens of places like this all over the world, Loki said. Okay, let's find out what we can and get out, Sunita said. So say we all? Holden asked. Cole shrugged. Nevea nodded and Sunita flashed a thumbs up. Umta shook her head. This is no place for me, Umta said. Then you can wait outside, Cole said. No, we're all sticking together, Loki said. And this should be a unanimous vote. Umta looked at Holden. She sighed. I will follow you. All right, so we'll rest here tonight, Holden said. Just remember, Loki said, be careful, chimed Nevea, Holden, and Sunita. Loki rubbed the back of his neck. It's just good advice. At least they'd been listening to him. True to Oz's word, Sanctuary's door was still open when they returned. They hadn't closed it behind them, and it did seem Oz couldn't operate even the basic controls without a human handprint. You're back! Oz jumped up. Loki palmed the inside hand scanner and the door closed silently and smoothly. No sense letting anything else in while they were here. We're ready for the grand tour. They followed Oz down the ramp, deeper into the bunker. A long time ago, it said. Sanctuary was a military installation, but when the earth became too poisonous to sustain human life, it was retrofitted to serve a new purpose, a shelter where people could wait for the caretakers to make the planet livable again. The same caretakers that killed everyone here? Loki asked. Oz flinched. Oz, are you okay? Nevea asked, looking concerned. Loki rolled his eyes. Sunita jabbed him in the side with an elbow. I'm sorry. It was... horrific. It went silent until they approached a door at the end of the ramp. A hand scanner beside it pulsed red. Oz gestured toward it. Who will do the honors? Nevea placed her hand on the panel. Nothing happened. Loki looked at Oz sharply, but the hologram was looking down at its Rubik's Cube. Oz? Loki asked. Huh, Oz said distracted. It's never done that before, but it's been a long time. Try it again? The panel transitioned from red to orange to blue. Nevea pressed her hand on it again. This time it turned green and the door opened. Oz clapped excitedly. That's better. Follow me. You really want to do that? Rena said. She was sitting next to Omri on the couch, supposedly chatting with friends on her laptop. But as he played Call of Duty with his classmate Brody, Omri had heard a series of sighs and chuckles from his big sister, obviously directed at him. Subtlety had never been her strong suit. What? Omri asked. That's obviously an ambush ahead? Or maybe you like getting fragged by aliens? You've never even played this, Omri said. It's just good advice, common sense. I asked if you wanted to play... Omri had been hurt when she had turned him down. He missed gaming with her. She'd been so busy with work and then training he couldn't remember the last time they'd played. And tomorrow she was being deployed halfway around the world on her first tour of duty. Maybe that was it. He imagined that when you were about to go do the real thing, the video game version of it must pale by comparison. But flying helicopters probably, hopefully, wouldn't expose her to ground fire and he highly doubted she would be engaging with alien combatants like the cryptids in COD. I'm working, Rena said. Right, like you aren't chatting with Andy, I bet he's going to miss you. Shh. She glanced at the door. 
Mom and Dad didn't know Rena had a boyfriend, which you'd think wouldn't matter when she was enough of an adult to put her life on the line for her country. As far as Omri could tell, that was the one thing that would shatter their parents' belief that she was a perfect child. Omri was holding on to that information like a get-out-of-jail-free card, to be played if he ever got in so much trouble that he had to deflect some of their attention. But he knew he'd never rat her out, because she'd never do anything like that to him. She'd always had Omri's back, and keeping her secret was the least he could do. The one way he could kind of protect her for a change. All right, big shot. What would you do different? Omri asked. Everything. She closed her laptop. First of all, you need to slow down. What's your hurry? Take a second to survey your environment and pick out places that could be hiding enemies. Look. The screen was split between Omri's and Brody's avatars. She pointed to a rock in the upper right corner of Omri's screen. I guarantee you there's a cryptid behind that. You think? But really, your first mistake was going into their underground lair in the first place without serious backup and firepower. That's the mission, Omri said. Good soldiers follow the mission even if it's stupid, right? True, Rena said. But you can still be smart about it. Don't take unnecessary risks. Be careful and watch out. Don't get so excited, it's just a game. No, watch out, she pointed to the screen. Omri snapped his attention back to the game as a flying gargoyle dived at him. He jerked the controller up and pounded the fire button, then rolled out of the way before it could literally bite his head off. It went for Brody instead. Omri, what the hell, man? Brody shouted from the TV. Gah, fuck, 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 get it off me! Omri brought his machine gun around and sprayed the alien to a pulp. You moron, Brody said. Omri switched on the mic in his headset. Sorry, I got distracted. Focus, damn it. You get up on that outcropping, check the terrain, I'll cover you. Omri glanced at Rena. I'm pretty sure that's an ambush, he told Brody. Hurry up, go, go, go. Whatever, it was just a game. Omri ran straight up the slope Rena had pointed out earlier and immediately died. He didn't even see what had killed him until he looked at Brody's screen and saw that a hunter had charged him and knocked him to his death. Brody was laughing. He didn't even try to save you, Rena said. Dick. Maybe he didn't see it, Omri said. I didn't. He saw. I was watching his screen. Why do you play with him? Because he's the only one who will play with me, Omri thought. He and Brody had exchanged gamer tags, but lest Omri mistake the gesture for actual friendship, Brody completely ignored him at school. And he only answered Omri's invitations to game together when he was in the right mood, which Omri figured meant when none of his other pals were online. People always act shittier online than they are in real life, Omri said. Well, they shouldn't, Rena said. It's how people behave when they don't think there are any consequences that shows who they really are. She smiled. Mind if I take over for a minute? Omri handed her the controller. He loved watching her play. She was a natural, with quick reflexes, a calm head, and impeccable aim. Now and then she told him what to relay to Brody through the headset, who had finally stopped mocking Omri and was struggling to keep up. Damn, Omri, that's more like it. You aren't playing like a girl anymore, Brody said. I'm sorry, Rena said. For what? Omri asked. She fired a round into the back of Brody's head. What the? Brody sputtered. She snatched the headset from Omri's head and thumbed the mic. That's how a girl shoots, fucker. The ramp from the entrance wrapped around and led down to the first level, a long corridor with doors on each side, like a hotel, complete with a deep blue carpet flecked with gold. Nice rug, Nevea said. It's tough to get stains out of it, Oz said. Loki eased one of the doors open. These all had old-fashioned mechanical locks and peered inside cautiously. The light came up and he saw the room was small, with four bunk beds on opposite walls, a video screen across from the door, a round table with four chairs, and a freestanding wardrobe. It looked like its occupants had just stepped out. One of the beds was unmade, an open book lying on top of the covers. A blue jumpsuit was draped over a chair. A poster showed the sun rising behind a silver rocket ship, weird iconography written across it. 
Probably some motivational bullshit. Oz, what does that sign say? Loki asked. Oz didn't even have to look into the room. Leave yesterday for a better tomorrow. Loki closed the door. The others had already begun exploring other rooms in the hallway. Unbelievable, so much for sticking together. He found Sunita in the adjoining room. It looked identical, except there was a guitar propped up in one corner and a chessboard on the table, its pieces arranged in mid-game. Who lived here? Sunita asked. Four people, Oz answered. Annalisa was the musician. I have one of her compositions on file. Music played softly around them, sort of a blend between classical and chiptune with a thrumming beat. Hold on, Loki said. Oz, you can't open doors, but you can play music. Oz smiled. I can handle quality of life functions, anything designed to make sanctuary citizens more comfortable. Of course, I could have done more for them, as much as they allowed me to, but I've noticed that humans prefer to be in control. Yeah, we do. Loki thought. How many bedrooms does Sanctuary have? Holden asked. One hundred. Twenty-five each on levels one, three, five, and seven. At maximum occupancy, we had three hundred and eighty-two residents. Oz paused for a moment, then shook its head. I miss them, it said softly. Nevea gave Oz a sympathetic look, then tactfully changed the subject. What's next on the tour? she asked, pointing down the hall. The commissary on level two. Loki's stomach rumbled. They hadn't eaten well in days. The commissary resembled a giant school cafeteria. We used this room for assemblies, movies, anything that required a big crowd. It was full when... Oz frowned. Never mind. That made Loki uneasy enough that he decided to stay near the entrance and keep an eye out while Oz showed the others how to work the food dispensers along the wall. You seem nervous, Holden said. Loki turned and Holden offered him a sandwich wrapped in wax paper. You don't, Loki said. Holden smiled. Good. Honestly, I'm freaking out right now, but I don't want to spread panic. He gave Loki a meaningful look. You want me to act less paranoid? Loki said. Nope, you're being the right amount of paranoid, and it helps keep us on our toes but maybe try not to antagonize Oz so much? It's not like it has real feelings. Loki took a bite of his sandwich and chewed. He couldn't tell what it was or was supposed to be. The bread was a little gritty, like it was actually made of sand. The filling had a cheddar-like texture, but it tasted nutty and fruity. He was hungry enough that he decided not to think about it too much. He was hungry enough that he'd probably eat it anyway, even if he found out it was made from the people who had disappeared. It's just that... Holden glanced over to where Oz was tapping something on his Rubik's Cube, and a panel glowed blue, then green under Sunita's hand. A pile of something appeared inside the replicator. What? Loki asked. You're sort of bullying him, Holden said softly. Loki narrowed his eyes. It, not him. Oz is a thing, not a person. But if Nevea is right about Oz suffering from something like post-traumatic stress, we should go slow with him, it. Maybe you aren't the most objective person when it comes to artificial intelligence? Whoa! I didn't mean Oz isn't Arcadia. Your instincts and mine are telling us something isn't right here. Maybe we should just go now and grab whatever we can find on the way out? Loki said. I still think it's important that we find out what happened here. Maybe some people escaped to another facility? We have to worry more about the people who are here now. Us. You don't think I... Holden laughed abruptly. Good one. Loki was momentarily confused at Holden laughing him off until he saw the rest of their group was joining them. They would have to continue this discussion later. Good, you got something to eat, Sunita said to Loki. Emphasis on something. Loki took another bite of his sandwich even though he had lost his appetite. Oz showed us how to print up a bunch of protein bars just in case. She gave handfuls of them to Holden and Loki. That's very thoughtful. Thank you, Oz. Holden stuffed some bars into his pockets. Oz grinned wide and bounced up and down on his toes, every bit like an excited kid. 
With stomachs and pockets full of food, Oz led them to the promised medical facility on level four. After much coaxing, Umta allowed Nevea to wash and bandage her injured hands. Loki noticed Sunita discreetly slipping extra bandages and ointments into her pockets and followed suit. Oz called the next room a library. Despite the paper book Loki had seen in the dorm room before, this was a small room with computer terminals and a stack of thin, flexible plastic sheets. He picked one up and text glowed on its transparent surface. Of course it's not in English, he said. English language selected, appeared on the sheet. Then the text shimmered and was replaced with the title page Seeking Sanctuary by Arwen Etcher, published in 2312. Loki spotted Oz talking to Cole by a terminal in the corner of the room. Cole pressed his thumb to the computer screen, and it flashed red, then green, and switched on. Oz fidgeted with his Rubik's Cube over and over. More of the puzzle had been solved, most of its faces glowing now in six solid colors, some squares still flashing red. What are you doing, Cole? Loki thought. Cole typed on the keyboard, and soon a picture of a young blonde woman appeared on the screen. Oz said something and Cole chuckled. He reached out to pat Oz's head, but his hand passed through the hologram. He squeezed his hand into a fist and frowned, turning back to the computer terminal. Loki cleared his throat, about to press Oz on what exactly had happened here, but Oz spoke before he could get a word out. Hey, who wants a hot shower? His little kid face looked eager, as if excited to share this treat with them. Yes, please, Nevea said. Oz motioned them out of the library. Loki added the room to the mental map of sanctuary that he was building. He was also keeping a running tally of all the locked doors they had encountered, at least a handful on each floor. He figured that must be where they were holding the good stuff. Weapons, communications equipment, commissary-type stuff, perhaps. Oz couldn't or wouldn't tell him what was inside them. The next section over had the promised bathroom with showers. Coed, it looked like. We don't have time for showers, Loki said. We are going to make time for this. It's been weeks since I've felt clean, and we're all smelling a little ripe, Sunita said. Nevea raised her hand. I vote for showers too. Some things don't need votes, Holden said. Well, let me check things over first, Loki said. Now you're just trying to feel important, Sunita smiled. She was joking but her words echoed in Loki's head while he walked through the bathroom slowly, opening every stall door, popping his head into every shower stall. Was he overdoing it? What did he think he was going to find in here? Oz trailed after him, reassuring him that it was perfectly safe, trying to explain the different features of the fancy toilets. Finally, Loki had to admit that there was nothing unusual here. The room looked exactly the way a bathroom should, with shiny white tiles, bright chrome, in fact, it wasn't that different from the locker room at Loki's high school. All clear, Loki said when he returned to the group. Why don't we shower in shifts, ladies first, Loki said. Why bother? There are curtains and we're all adults here. Sunita gave Loki a challenging look. I'm just going to wait out here and keep watch, just in case, he said. I'll do that, Oz said. Loki ignored it. Sunita looked disappointed. Suit yourself. Loki waited outside the bathroom with Umta and Oz, feeling like an idiot. He didn't think anything of putting himself on the line, even charging toward two killer robots with nothing but a crafted axe, but he didn't have the courage to take his clothes off in front of other people. You don't want a shower? Loki asked Umta. She wrinkled her nose. I prefer baths. Outside. She shifted her eyes toward Oz. In private. I like my privacy too, Loki said. I know, she said gently. Loki was surprised that of everyone, Umta seemed to get him. That was the extent of their conversation, but unlike most other interactions, the silence wasn't awkward at all. They were both people of few words. He and Umta hadn't spent much time alone together. Truthfully, at first her appearance had disturbed him, but if anyone could look past appearances, it was Loki. No, he'd kept his distance from her because he had the unnerving feeling that Umta was not buying his bullshit. Half the time he felt like she was humoring him. 
If she knew that he was bluffing about his experience and knowledge, though, to get the other kids to like and trust him, she had been keeping her suspicions to herself. What was that, if not an act of kindness? Maybe he should try to get to know her better. Suddenly, shouting came from the other side of the door. Sunita screamed. Oz looked alarmed and disappeared. Umta bolted back into the bathroom, Loki hot on her heels. It took a while before Omri realized he wasn't hearing gunshots but someone banging on his bedroom door. He pulled his headphones off and reached over to open it. His father stepped into the room. Why do you keep locking this? Dad said. Sorry. Not sorry. What's up? Come into the family room. The knights are here. From the tone of Dad's voice, Omri figured this wasn't a friendly social call. But he couldn't imagine what would bring them over to his house unannounced. Omri followed Dad out of his room and found Brody and his parents sitting on the sofa across from Omri's mother. Two glasses of water and a soda on the coffee table in front of them hadn't been touched. Brody shot Omri a nervous, embarrassed look before staring back down at his folded hands. Hey, Omri said. Brody? Mr. and Mrs. Knight? Sit. Dad grabbed Omri by the shoulder and steered him over to the least comfortable chair. What's this all about? Mom asked. Mrs. Knight opened her large purse and pulled out a magazine, holding it by a corner between her thumb and index finger. She tossed it onto the coffee table with a smack. Mom gasped. Omri's eyes widened when he saw it was an issue of Penthouse magazine. The cover showed a woman wearing a white scarf and pants and a red jacket open to bare her chest. She was holding a riding crop behind her neck. The headline called it the Hunt and Be Hunted issue. Uh, Omri said. Your son left this filth at our house. Mrs. Knight said. Omri shook his head. That isn't mine. Omri. Mom sounded so disappointed and tired. Honestly, I've never been, Omri began. I didn't even know he brought it over, Brody cut in. He didn't sound tough the way he did at school or online. His voice was slightly higher and more exaggerated, like he was imitating a precocious kid in some shitty sitcom. But his act was working. I've never been to their house, Omri thought. And Brody had never been to his until right now. They weren't that kind of friends. They weren't really friends at all. In fact, since Rena had taken Brody out and embarrassed him in Call of Duty, Brody had unfriended Omri online. Where would I even get that? Omri asked. And why when you can get free porn online? He shut up when he saw the look on his mom's face. Brody caught his eye again. Now Omri understood what his expression meant. It was a plea for help. Now, hold on, Dad said. Where did you find the magazine, Maggie? Under Brody's mattress. She suddenly looked defensive. I was changing his sheets. I don't know why Omri would leave a magazine there, or how he could manage without your son noticing. Is it possible that... Dad glanced at Mr. Knight. Mr. Knight's face grew red. Absolutely not. I'm not interested in that sort of thing. That's right, Mrs. Knight said. Brody squirmed unhappily in his seat. What a weird family, Omri thought. But that explained a lot about Brody. It's mine, Omri said. Son? Dad asked. It's mine, Omri repeated. I bought it, but then I got worried about keeping it around the house and... I didn't want to throw it out, so I hid it at Brody's. He looked at Brody. Sorry, man. No problem, Brody said graciously. Disgusting, Mrs. Knight said. We are so sorry, Omri's mom said. He's been having a difficult time lately. His sister moved out recently. I'm sure, but I'm afraid your son isn't welcome in our home any longer, Mr. Knight said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause any trouble. Omri said. Mr. and Mrs. Knight stood up. After a moment, Brody stood too, all smiles now. Dad looked at Omri. Get your hard drive. You're grounded. No video games. For how long? Omri said. Until I say so. Mom picked up the penthouse and tossed it into the trash as she and Dad walked the knights out. 
She turned and gave Omri one last look of utter disappointment and shame. Why did I do that? Omri asked himself. It didn't seem fair to get punished for doing a good deed, but he had only himself to blame. He stalked to his room to collect his computer. This was a standard punishment, even though it meant that Omri would have to go to school early to use the computer lab. Then he hurried back to the family room and retrieved the magazine from the garbage. He flipped through it, tore out some pages, and tossed it back in the trash. Might as well have something for his trouble. Oops. Loki froze, staring until Nevea yelled something at him and he turned his head, covering his eyes. Sorry, he said. When they heard the shouts, Loki had imagined the worst, a bloodbath like the one back at their camp when they'd lost Wesley and Jing Wei and too many others. The sight he saw was still shocking, but a nice shock. He'd gotten an eyeful of Sunita and Nevea standing outside their showers, dripping wet and holding towels. Get out! Nevea shouted. We heard shouts. We thought you were in trouble, Loki said. The hot water cut out, that's all. It's okay, you can open your eyes now, Sunita said. Loki lowered his hand. The girls had wrapped the towels securely around themselves. Nevea, blushing furiously, glared at Loki. Sunita was wringing water from her long hair and wearing a serene expression. Umta snorted. As she left the bathroom, she said, Hormones! Holden and Cole emerged from the other side of the partition, separating the shower room into two sides. As you heard, we used the last of the hot water, but you'd probably rather have a cold shower anyway now, huh? Holden grinned. Sunita laughed. Loki took a couple of steps backward. He just wanted to get out of there, leave the bathroom, leave sanctuary, find a hole to crawl into and die. Sunita's smile faded. Loki? Loki hurried out of the bathroom, running right through Oz, who had been standing quietly just inside the door, observing them. Umta was nowhere to be found. Loki leaned against the wall in the hallway, taking gasping breaths. His hands were sweaty, shaking. Things had been going so well. But now Loki didn't know how he could face seeing the others again. He knew when they got back to Inez's group, someone would tell them what had happened, and he'd never live it down. He felt a hand on his shoulder. My hero, Sunita said. He jerked away. Don't be like that. Be like what? He shook his head, his lips pressed tightly together. Hey, don't do that. We're having a conversation, okay? Loki, I was making a joke about the situation, not about you. We know you were trying to help. We were just surprised. She'd gotten dressed but the image of her naked was burned into his retinas, her wet brown skin, her strong bare shoulders. Yeah, he could use that cold shower now. What's gotten into you? Sunita asked. I'm sorry, but... He took a deep breath. People used to make fun of me. A lot. I thought I'd left all that behind. His cheeks burned with embarrassment. Sunita blinked. See, was that so hard? What? Opening up. She smiled. We were all someone else before. But things change. We've changed, and... I'd rather make out with you than make fun of you. Loki's eyebrows shot up. Tell me more. She leaned in and kissed him. Loki had always gotten his highs from winning difficult video games, pulling off tricky shots on missions with his sister or Brody, saving the day for imaginary people in some virtual reality. But kissing Sunita, his first kiss, was a million times more exciting. Real life was definitely better than games. Sunita shivered. He dropped his bazooka and wrapped his arms around her cold body, pulling her close. They both warmed up in no time. Seriously? Cole said. Loki and Sunita separated and saw Cole and Nevea in the open doorway of the bathroom. Cole watching them and Nevea pointedly not looking at them. Oz was there too. That was getting seriously creepy. Sorry, I yelled at you, Nevea said. You caught me off guard. Thanks for coming to our rescue. Yeah. Loki scooped up his gun. I think we should just keep moving. 
Sunita shook her head. Oh, no, you're getting a shower, mister. She propelled him down the hall. But don't worry. We'll keep watch out here until you're done. It will be the safest shower you've ever taken. She shoved Loki into the bathroom and then closed the door behind him. He stood there for a moment, breathing in the warm, damp air and listening to the soft drip, drip, drip of water from a spout in one of the showers. Holden stepped out of a stall. Dude, are you crying? Loki wiped the tears away from his face. He thought about making up some lame excuse, but it was Holden. Shut up, Loki said. Holden pulled on his shirt and then gave Loki a sober look. Sorry, just wanted to make sure you're all right. And that almost made the waterworks really get going because of all the snarky, silly, stupid things Holden could have said, the things anyone at school would have said if they thought he'd been crying. He'd said something nice instead. Thanks, Loki said. And I apologize for arguing with you before. I know you're always watching out for us. I was out of line. There was some truth in what you said, Loki admitted. In what you said, too. So, more good? Loki asked. Of course. We have to keep each other honest to keep everyone else safe. Holden pointed to the bazooka cradled in Loki's arms. You aren't showering with that, are you? Loki laughed. I'm not that paranoid. But he did plan to leave it within arm's reach, just outside of the shower stall. Right. See you out there. Holden casually saluted Loki and left the bathroom. Despite Sunita's reassurances, Loki half expected the girls to burst in on him in the middle of his shower in playful revenge. Between his paranoia and the frigid water, he probably broke his old record for the fastest shower a skill he'd picked up from high school gym class and ROTC and quickly dressed in the shower stall. He sniffed his shirt before he pulled it back on. They did need new clothes, or at least a laundry room. Oz had been hard selling it, but this place really had everything you needed to ride out the end of the world in comfort. Loki wondered what it would be like for them to live out their days there together. It was underground, so it was defensible especially if they figured out how caretakers had infiltrated it so they could prevent it from happening again. At the very least, he could see them bringing the rest of the group back and staying for a while until they felt ready to go on, until they had a plan other than stay alive. Not that that was a bad plan. He was really into that plan, but there had to be more to this second life than just living. When Loki returned to the hall, he saw that Umta had returned and the group was gathered around Oz. Only, everyone looked depressed. Who died? Loki asked. Holden grimaced. Everyone. Omri found Brody waiting by his locker at the start of the lunch period. Hey, Brody said. Mmm. Omri waited for Brody to move out of the way before entering his locker combination. When he opened the door, a paperback of The Most Dangerous Game fell out. Brody picked it up and wrinkled his nose. We have to read this too. Omri grabbed the book and then stared at him pointedly. When my mom confronted me, I panicked and said the first name I thought of, Brody said. I guess I should be flattered, Omri said. Brody laughed. Did you get in a lot of trouble? I lost computer privileges for a little while. Damn. Well, when you get them back, give this a try. Brody handed Omri a CD. I burned you a copy of this sick new MMO, an island survival game. It's cracked. I thought we could play it sometime. Omri was speechless. Never mind, you don't have to play it, Brody said. No, I will. Thanks, it sounds great, Omri said. Okay. Brody smiled. You have lunch now, right? Come sit with us, me, Eric, and Ashton. They're gamers too, but you're way better than them. Omri slid the CD into the middle of his book and shoved it into his backpack, then slammed his locker door shut and accompanied Brody to the cafeteria. Being grounded sucked, but it was worth it. It was nice to have a real friend. Oz's childish voice echoed in the hallway as they followed the hologram down to the lowest level of the bunker. They got in. The caretakers. I don't know how, but they were different. 
far more advanced than the ones I knew. They were off-spec, modified and mutilated, and they started murdering people. My people. Oz fell silent. That was three hundred years ago. What, um... Loki coughed. What happened to the bodies? Oz's voice faded a little. The invading caretakers took them after they sabotaged Sanctuary and dismantled its caretakers. I couldn't see what they did with their bodies or where they went when they left. Ugh, Sunita said. Is there any chance they'll come back? Holden asked. Almost certainly. The two outside likely broadcast your location to the cohort, or some of them will be along to find out why they haven't reported back. Oz stopped in front of a door on level six. This is hydroponics. Your turn, Loki. It pointed to the hand scanner on the door. Loki examined the glowing red screen, but couldn't read the blinking text. What's that say? He asked. Hydroponics, Oz repeated impatiently. Loki put his palm on the screen and it cycled from red to orange to yellow to green to blue. Good, Oz said. Thank you. The door opened. Loki got a whiff of something awful and palmed the scanner again to close the door. Ugh, he said. The large room had been dark and smelled like the kitchen trash when he hadn't taken it out for a few days. Earthy, organic, rotting. Whatever had been growing in there was long dead. Oz, if you couldn't stop the caretakers from slaughtering everyone before, Sunita said, what makes you think you can protect us now? If the human leaders of Sanctuary had given me greater control, I could have saved them. I was given only limited access to the defense systems. I couldn't even lock doors. The caretakers overwhelmed us quickly, and all I could do was stand by and watch. Oz's image glitched, blurring and tearing around the edges like a weak video signal. Glowing lines of code trickled down its face like digital tears. Instead, they looked at me as mere maintenance or a personal assistant. Oz, it's a little chilly in here. Could you turn up the heat? Oz, what's 832 times 23? Oz, what's on my schedule today? I was a nanny for their children, but I promise I'll never let anyone hurt you again. Again? Oz wasn't confusing them with the people who lived at Sanctuary before, was he? Either he thought they were interchangeable, or it had been a slip of the tongue, or whatever the digital equivalent would be, Whichever, not encouraging. Concern finally cracked through Holden's calm facade. He must have come to the same conclusion Loki had. Didn't anyone survive? Sunita asked. Oz's projection stabilized. One boy left Sanctuary just before the caretakers arrived. He was lucky. Holden perked up. Where did he go? That's a great question, Holden, Oz said. Um... If caretakers could be on their way here, Nevea said. We should leave, Loki said, right now. You don't understand. Once I'm up and fully operational, this is the safest place you can be. It will truly be sanctuary, Oz said. Thanks for the welcome, Oz, but if it's all the same, we have to get going now, Holden said. Oz held up its hands. Wait, I was saving the best for last. I can show you where the other sanctuaries are, and we can try to contact them from here. The caretakers couldn't have infiltrated all of them. At the very least, maybe some people got away. It would be nice to have something for all the trouble it took to find this place, Holden said. And I still have a lot of questions, Cole chimed in. Sunita brandished an axe. The more we know, the better equipped we'll be to figure out what we need to do, whether we stay here and fight or leave and fight. It won't take long, will it, Oz? Oh, no, no time at all, Oz said. Loki hesitated before shaking his head. He hated to disagree with Sunita, but he'd meant what he told Holden about following your instincts. He was suspicious of Sanctuary, and he didn't trust Oz. Chances were they would end up disagreeing on plenty of subjects in the future. It isn't worth the risk, Loki said. We'll make it quick. Get the info we need and get out, okay? Holden said. The others nodded. Oz pouted, but he agreed. I wish you'd stay, but I can't stop you from leaving. True to its word, Oz took them straight to an access panel beside a sturdy door on level six. This one is special, 
Oz said. Extra security. Holden, why don't you unlock it? Press your hand to the pad and say, Disengage System Lock Ozymandias Protocol 1. Holden went to the panel and did as Oz said. The red light flashed. Then the panel went dark. Uh, Holden said. Oz smiled. He looked down at the completed Rubik's Cube in his hand. Try it again, Holden. Holden pressed his hand to the panel and the door whooshed open. Loki peeked in first. Inside was a small command center that reminded Loki of the security room he and Holden had discovered in a mall back in Arcadia, with video monitors and an array of communications equipment. Seems clear, Loki said. The group filed in, and Loki switched on one of the screens. No fancy motion gestures like in Arcadia, just buttons and touchpads. Turn that off, Oz said. Loki froze. This was the first time Oz had told them they weren't allowed to do something, which meant he was going to keep doing it. The screen showed different areas of sanctuary. Loki swiped a finger across the screen to change the feed rapidly, seeing many of the areas they had visited on the levels above. Just as he saw the door to Sanctuary from the outside, the screen switched off. Sanctuary had cameras outside. Everything clicked into place. Uh-oh, Loki said. What's up? Sunita asked. Loki? Oz said. We never told you how many caretakers there were at the entrance, Loki said. But a little while ago you said... The two outside likely broadcast your position. You've been spying on us. I was fulfilling my role, protecting Sanctuary. Oz's image flickered and faded, and Loki could see the open door through him. You knew all about us and the caretakers before we arrived. What else are you hiding from us? Loki asked. Nothing, Oz said. Goodbye, Holden said. But the information you wanted, Oz said clearly wouldn't be trustworthy coming from you. Thanks for everything, but no thanks, Loki said. I'm guessing we can't contact the other sanctuaries from here. Holden looked around one last time, wistfully. Oz's young face looked downcast. No, he said. We'll find them ourselves, Loki said. That isn't necessary, it said. We have everything you need here. There is no we, it's just you. Loki said. Please, don't go, Oz said. It's too dangerous out there. The caretakers... Holden headed for the door. It slammed shut in front of him. Holden slapped the hand panel to open it, but the door didn't budge. He tried again. Sunita pushed past him and put her palm against the panel. Still nothing. Ozymandias! Holden whirled to face the hologram. It no longer looked like a boy. It was an older man with short brown hair, a bushy mustache, and a visor over his eyes. This is for your own good, Oz said. I'll give you everything you want. Everything you've ever wanted. Umta started banging on the door, moaning. Blood soaked through the bandages on her hands. Holden and Loki pulled her away. Wait a minute, Sunita said. You said you couldn't operate the doors. Those panels we've been scanning, Loki said. I thought there was something more to them. They're different than the ones we've seen before. Is that right, Oz? I needed each of you to grant me unlimited access to sanctuary systems. It only recognizes human inputs from at least five unique individuals who are in the chain of command. As the only humans here, that's you. You helped me help you, Oz said. You tricked us. Holden leaned against the wall by the door, no longer trying to hide how freaked out he was. Oz, what do you want? Loki asked wearily. Allow me to take care of you. I promise to always keep you happy and safe from harm. All I ask in return is your friendship. That didn't sound so bad. Except that Oz wasn't asking for their friendship, it was demanding it. Now that Loki had real friends, he saw Oz for what it was. A bully. Loki wondered if his bazooka would even put a dent in the door on the surface. If caretakers had managed to break in once, however they did it, there had to be a way to break out. You can't keep us here forever, Nevea said. No, of course not, Oz said. The door beside Holden opened, 
Loki fought the urge to run out and race to the surface as quickly as he could. Maybe Oz could be reasoned with after all? Oz smiled. Provided you each behave, you'll have free run of sanctuary and the freedom to enjoy all it offers. Oh, Loki thought. For as long as you live, Oz finished. Oh, shit. This has been Remade, Season 2, Episode 4. Child's Play. Written by E.C. Myers. Narrated by Greg Tremblay. Audio produced by Amanda Rose Smith. Musical theme by Amanda Rose Smith. Copyright 2017, Serial Box Publishing. Production Copyright 2017, Serial Box Publishing. <laughs>